Coach Garner here from HockeyTraining.com. In this video, I want to talk to you about should hockey players train to failure? This is something that a lot of hockey players do intuitively because they have the competitive athletic mindset. They want to work hard. They want to go all out. They want to grind. They want to do um, you know, that kind of uh, what it takes, whatever it takes mentality in order to get the job done. But um, as the research continues to come out, uh, not all old school tough guy mentalities uh, make their way through to be considered optimal. And what was considered optimal back then is not always considered optimal in present day. And training to failure is something where there's actually a lot of research in this area now that, um, that has, has brought a lot of controversy, but now clarity towards what athletes should and shouldn't be doing when it comes to making maximal progress. Now, effective reps. This is a, a category of thinking that's been more formalized recently by Dr. Carl Junot. And uh, it's the idea of effective reps. And if you're a fan of uh, strength culture in general, you may have seen a documentary all the way back in like either the 70s or the 80s called Pump and Iron. And in that documentary, it's got a, a bunch of um, classic strength guys in there, like Dave Draper, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Columbo, like all of them, they're, they're all in there. The Incredible Hulk, the dude where they just painted him green and then he was good enough to be the Hulk. They're all in that documentary. And in that documentary, it includes a lot of interviews on what guys were doing. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, a guy with excellent instincts when it came to training and nutrition, even when there wasn't a lot of scientific information around, he said in an interview that it's the last four reps that matter the most. He said, you're doing a set, he said those last four reps are what is truly going to determine the quality of that set or not. And as the research has continued to come out, that's kind of become now more formally known as effective reps in that it's the final reps that's going to allow the body to disrupt homeostasis enough to the point to apply a positive stressor and force it to adapt and come back bigger, stronger, or more uh, with more endurance, whatever the set was actually for. So an example of, an, of uh, what effective reps means is let's say you're doing a set of 20. Well, the first five reps are not really anything. I mean, you're kind of just banging it out. The first 10 reps don't really feel like anything. 10 to 15, you might kind of start feeling something, but from 15 to 20, that's what you did all of the 15 reps before for those last five reps. So when you think about effective reps, just think about the reps that are actually creating the greatest amount of stress on your body that you're trying to apply with that exercise. That is an effective rep, and it's, it's a new area of thinking that not all reps are created equally. Now, ideas about this have existed from, say, Schwarzenegger for, what, 50 years now? But um, the, what originally got my brain turning on something like this was research that came out in 2005 by Goto et al. And Goto et al, this is a, an excellent study. And what they did is they actually had, I didn't write it down, but they had, a, a, they had two different groups. And they performed leg extensions and lat pull downs. And uh, both groups were tested to identify their 10 rep max. So if you were going to do 10 straight reps, you would fail if you tried 11, right? You, you have your 10 rep max on the bar. So groups are divided. There are 10 rep maxes identified. And then you are to perform either 10 reps straight, your 10 rep max straight, or you perform five reps and then rest for 30 seconds and then finish your final five reps. Well, at the end of this study, the 10 straight group gained 12.9% more muscle, whereas the five 30 seconds, five, only gained 4% more muscle throughout the duration of this innervation. That is a huge difference. You know, put another way, the 10 straight group gained over three times as much muscle than the five 30 seconds, five group. So when you're looking at this through the lens of identifying effective reps, that makes sense. Because if you did 10 reps straight of your 10 rep max, when you get to rep 7, 8, 9, 10, like those last four are going to be very difficult. If it's your true 10 rep max, your last four are going to be hard. Whereas if you do reps 1 to 5, even of your 10 rep max, 
It's not that hard. And then you get 30 seconds rest, and then you kind of just do reps one to five again. So you never actually had the difficulty or the necessary fiber recruitment or the necessary neural stress that's required in reps six to 10 or reps seven to 10. So this is kind of like reps one to five, rest one to five. Whereas one to five still happened here, but then six to 10 happened here as well. So this group got more effective reps done in their set and therefore gained more than three times as much muscle. And you guys, but this is, uh, what, 17 years ago? Something like that now? A long time. And since then, that was kind of a catalyst for sports science. And since then, a lot of research has come out. And I implore you to go look at it, right? Um, one thing that I'm very big on, this channel is called Hockey Science Unleashed for a reason. I speak from the evidence. I speak from the literature. So if anybody um, you know, uh, ever wants to go look at all of this stuff, Absolutely. I 100% um, invite you to go check out the literature because everything on this channel is very, very dialed in. And there's a reason why every single video is done uh, on a whiteboard because that's all we need in order to explore real scientific topics. When you compile the literature, it kind of looks like an S-curve. So in statistical analysis, if you're unfamiliar with an S-curve, an S-curve kind of looks like an S on its side. And that's kind of what we see in statistical analysis with respect to reps in reserve. Now, this is something where um, nobody can stop me right now, so I'm gonna kind of give myself a pat in the back <laughs> because uh, if, you, if you've been with hockey training for a long time, all the way back to 2015, I had reps in reserve recommendations for the athletes here at hockey training. All the way back in 2015, so seven years ago. And that was based upon this growing body of evidence and where I knew it was going. So yours, there's an S-curve in statistical analyses when combining all of the literature with respect to reps in reserve. What is reps in reserve? It's a formal way of talking about how many reps you had left in the tank. So if I, if I said, put your 10 RM on the bar, but do a set of eight, what did you have? Two reps in reserve, right? You had two reps in the tank. If I said, uh, even if we don't even have rep max, if I just say, do a set of 12, um, no, uh, put a weight on the bar that you could get for 12, but then only do eight. Well, then you did a set with four reps in reserve. So it's a, it's a formalized way to discuss keeping reps in the tank on every single set. And the S curve comes from the idea that if you have five reps in reserve on a set, you will gain some muscle and strength. If you have four reps in reserve after a set, you will gain more muscle and strength than you would if you left five reps in the tank. If you leave three reps in the tank from a set, you will gain more muscle and strength than you would if you left four reps in the tank. And then it kind of starts to taper off a little bit. So the amount of muscle and strength gain between three and four reps in reserve, you can consider it, let's just say it's like this big. The difference between two and three reps in reserve went from here to here. So you will gain more muscle mass and more strength with two uh, RIR compared to three, but not as much as three compared to four. And this is where the S starts to take into, come into play. And then if you train with one rep in reserve, it really starts to taper off, okay? So you will gain a little bit more muscle if you have one rep in reserve compared to two reps in reserve. But let's say you gained this much muscle with two reps in reserve, you're only going to gain about that much muscle with one rep in reserve. So the difference is very, very, very minimal. And then this nearly completely flattens out going to failure. So comparing one rep in reserve to failure, it is like, it, it, I won't even be able to show you because the difference, even statistically, is incredibly small. So you build muscle with five reps in reserve, build a little bit more with four reps in reserve, build a little bit more with three reps in reserve, build a little bit more with two reps in reserve, build a tiny bit more but hardly much with one rep in reserve, and then one compared to failure is uh, next to nothing. So this reps in reserve ideology is gaining a ton of momentum, especially in the world of sports science because it is such a, a safer way to train for athletes because what is the difference in injury risk if you go all the way to failure versus if you leave one to two reps in the tank? 
The difference is catastrophic. Like if you leave two reps in the tank, your technique can be freaking perfect the whole way through. Whereas if you go all the way to failure, your risk for injury goes way up. It goes way up. And why? For this much more? Like it, it starts not making sense. You know what? Another thing that goes way up? Fatigue accumulation. Going to failure is way more fatiguing than leaving two reps in the tank. But why are we doing that? For this much more? It's not making a lot of sense because now we're bringing more fatigue accumulation onto the ice, onto practice, onto skill sessions, and we are also increasing our risk for injury. Sounds like our training's not really serving us anymore the way in which we should, in the way in which it should be. Remember, we're in the gym to become better hockey players. We're not in the gym to become better weightlifters. There's a big difference between that, and that's why I'm so excited about this type of literature. And then very recently, Carol et al. in 2019, awesome study. Okay, they compared two different groups and instead of just lap pull downs and leg extensions, they put them on an actual program. So they were doing total body workouts throughout this whole program and both groups were on the exact same program, but one group trained at an RPE of eight. So this is rating of perceived exertion. If 10 was your all out effort, eight would be very hard, but not all out. So one group trained at an RPE of eight and the next group trained on their last set of each exercise to absolute failure. So eight out of 10 effort versus last set of each exercise to absolute failure. They're, both groups are on the exact same program. What were the results? RPE of eight group actually gained more muscle and with statistical analysis was trending towards continuing to gain more muscle than the failure group. So the failure group not only gained less muscle in the intervention period, but they were trending to do even worse long term as well. This goes against the ideology that a lot of hockey players have where you need to go all out for absolutely everything. It's not the case. And usually that's how you run into overtraining and injury. And this type of literature um, that again, I really recommend you go check out because this is not my opinion. This is published data that you can go review. It's huge for hockey players. And again, let's revisit my pat on the back because in 2015, I said hockey players should have four reps in reserve during the in season. And I said two reps in reserve during the off season. Okay, seven years ago, I made these recommendations. And four years before this study even came out. In season, I said four reps in reserve. I knew where this was going because if we leave four reps in reserve during the in season, that's freaking perfect. We're still building muscle and we're still building strength, yet we have absolutely zero risk of developing an injury in the gym. So no games missed, no practices missed, and you're able to reach your true performance potential. But guess what? The number one goal of the in season is performance. It's not gym gains. What do you need to perform? Recovery. You will only perform to the degree that you are recovered. How fatigued do you think you're going to be if you leave four reps in the tank on every single set? You're not going to be really fatigued at all. You're going to, you're going to, you have that feeling where like that workout felt great. Like you leave the gym energized rather than beat down. That's what in season training is supposed to do. Like you're really trying to accomplish two things. You want to um, create the hockey performance body. So you want that hockey specific strength and muscle mass, but you do not want fatigue accumulation to ruin your performance during practices or ruin your performance during games or put you at risk of an injury. You don't want any of that stuff. So four reps in reserve allows you to build and maintain the hockey performance machine of your body all in season long without risk of injury or fatigue accumulation. Perfect. But what's the number one goal of the off season? Ch adaptation, changing our body. Now we have the time and the resources available to us to maximize strength, speed, conditioning, agility, uh, muscular hypertrophy, mobility, you name it. We can smash it all in the off season. And we don't have to worry about fatigue accumulation as much because we're not in season. We don't have the same practice schedule. We don't have the same game schedule if we even have a practice and game schedule at all. So what do we do? We make it a little harder on ourselves. We bump this up to two reps in reserve because that's where the S curve begins to really start tapering off. 
So in the off season, we can go harder, gain lots of hockey specific muscle and strength, speed, conditioning, the whole deal, and not run into overtraining because we're not going to failure, not get injured and therefore ruin our dry land training because we're not going to failure, and yet pretty much get the exact same results as our going to failure counterparts who feel like crap, whose hips and elbows and shoulders and knees hurt, who is tired, who needs progressively stronger and stronger and stronger pre-workouts because they are digging a deeper and deeper debt of fatigue from their training on a daily basis. We all know these people. They don't read sports science. You follow this channel, so you're caught up to speed. I made these recommendations seven years ago, and they still hold true today. So if you want my guidelines on what hockey players should be doing, leave four reps in the tank on your main movements during the in-season and leave two reps in the tank on your main movements during the off-season. That is the way you use the gym to become a better hockey player and not just become a better weightlifter. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to this channel, like the video if you learned something, and as always, go to hockeytraining.com.